So a while ago, I made a video called Who Would Win? Goku versus the My Hero Academia universe, and it is now one of my most viewed videos on this channel. While the response to the video was mostly positive, the comment section was mostly combative and argumentative, which actually makes a lot of sense. People who agree with me aren't as likely to voice their opinions as opposed to people who disagree with me. I honestly don't mind as I really enjoy arguing, but after a while, most of the comments just felt repetitive. I now realize that I didn't put as much detail as I should have in the original video, but I am making this one to correct that. Hopefully this video provides enough insight as to why I made the choices that I did in the last video. And to be honest, I'm also making this video so I no longer have to address the same counter arguments over and over again. There were 162 comments on the video, including back and forths, and from those comments I was able to obtain a total of 5 different counter arguments, with 2 of them having multiple subsets, kinda like how you see a question on a test that has subset sections from A to D. So the format of this video will be me addressing 5 different arguments by responding to each comment. I don't really have a big community, so this isn't something that I have to worry about, but just in case this video does get big, I want to include a little disclaimer. Do not harass the people who are featured in this video, none of this stuff is remotely serious as at the end of the day it is just a discussion about anime. I would hate to see people get bullied because of their anime opinions. If you're going to make fun of anyone, make fun of me because I'm the hot rodster and I can handle it. With all of that being said, let's get into the first argument. You have underestimated the My Hero characters and you have overestimated the Dragon Ball characters. Yeah, believe it or not, there are some people who actually believe that I underestimated the characters from My Hero Academia. Now, these comments were actually quite rare in comparison to those who believe that I underestimated Goku and or overestimated the My Hero characters, but these ones were kind of baffling, so I wanted to start with them. Akshay Rarat argued that I was underestimating Deku specifically because of my analysis of All Might. In the video, I basically said that All Might's strongest attack pales in comparison to anything that Goku could do, as his clashes with Beerus destroyed planets. Therefore, Deku, who can't use 100% of one for all, wouldn't stand a chance against Goku. However, this person correctly pointed out that All Might wasn't at full power in his battle against All For One due to his injuries, so he should be way stronger at 100%. And since One For All stockpiles strength, Deku will be even stronger than All Might's peak in the future. While that technically is correct, there are two problems with that analysis. Firstly, while Deku will be stronger in the future, to assume that he will be stronger than Goku is a huge reach. And lastly, the video was analyzing anime Deku and anime Goku. So despite what may happen in the future, the truth is that Deku currently has nothing on Goku. Another user that goes by Bakugo left 5 comments saying stuff like Deku doing push ups is enough to beat Goku. It was honestly really difficult to understand if this person was being serious or if he was just memeing. But the fact that they left multiple comments leads me to believe that they were very serious about this. I don't think I really have to address why these arguments are bad. I mean, it's pretty obvious that this person isn't really making an argument at all. I think he was just trying to defend his My Hero characters as it was very obvious to him what the point of this video was. Which brings me to my next point. I don't understand the purpose of this video and or the percentages. While this may sound like an insulting way to summarize some of the comments, it just seemed to be the case for a lot of them. For example, Speed Beyond Logic said that in order for these scenarios to work, Goku would have to have his guard down, which isn't as likely as Goku blitzing everyone. I don't know why they would respond to me with this as it isn't something I disagree with. If I thought that it was more likely for my Hero Academia character to beat Goku than the other way around, then the percentage chance at victory for all of them would be greater than 50%. However, there's only one character who's even above 50%, and that was Hitoshi Shinsho. I believe that in most scenarios, Goku would completely dominate any character from My Hero Academia. I also think that the scenarios in which Goku loses would be ones where he is more relaxed and has his guard down. Comments like these make it clear to me that they didn't understand the purpose of this video, and maybe I am partly to blame for that, so I'm going to lay it out right now. I'm pretty sure that we all know that Goku is this overpowered god and therefore he is leagues above other universes in strength. The point I wanted to make in this video was that in some specific circumstances, even Goku could lose to these lower tier characters. Like take Stain for instance, I don't believe that he can actually compete with Goku, but in the video I focused on the specific scenarios in which he could probably win. Then I gave a percentage chance that I thought he had of winning, which I believe I said was less than 5%, but I would probably solidify that to around 2.5% now. But some people, like Thomas Horn, were very critical of me for even saying that there was a chance that someone like Stain could beat Goku. They accused me of cherry picking scenarios that led to My Hero Academia characters winning the fight, yet didn't realize that the point of the analysis was to find those specific scenarios. I honestly don't know if they even realized that I believe Goku would win the overwhelming majority of these fights. 
One last thing I wanted to mention before moving on was this comment from Dobby Chimbabwe. They argued that Shinsho's brainwash wouldn't work since Goku and Vegeta resisted something called evil manipulation key in Dragon Ball Heroes. I honestly don't know what that is since I haven't ever seen that show. I realized that my rules for the battles weren't specific enough. I never meant to include heroes because I never watched it, but I did imply that characters, events, and feats that I would be using have to be in the anime. Technically, Dragon Ball Heroes is an anime, but I definitely didn't mean to include it. So right now I shall make the correct action. I will only be considering things from Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball Super, and depending on the circumstances, even Dragon Ball GT. With that out of the way, let's move on to the actual arguments. Goku can resist mind control. Okay, so this argument was one that I saw a lot in the comment section of my last video, and it has a lot more specific arguments that I definitely will be addressing. This came up because when I put Shinsho up against Goku, I gave him a 70% chance of victory due to his brainwashing quirk. My main point is that we never really seen Goku resist mind control, so it is reasonable to assume that he can't. I am surprised that no one brought up the time that Goku broke out of hypnosis in the original Dragon Ball series. It was done during the 21st World Martial Arts Tournament by Jackie Chun, aka Master Roshi, on Kid Goku. And Goku did break out of that, but he didn't do it alone. He got distracted by Bulma, which is definitely third party interference. Dinner? Dinner? Where's dinner? I want dinner? Is there something left for me? Hello? The point is, I don't think Goku could break out of mind control by himself. Characters in Dragon Ball have resisted psychic abilities. Therefore, Goku can resist any kind of mind control. Some of the specific examples that were brought to my attention were Mercenary Tao resisting General Blue's psychic paralysis and Nappa also resisting Chaozu's psychic paralysis. These are telekinetic abilities, and I can't believe I have to point out that telekinesis is very different from mind control. So telekinesis involves using the mind to attack, restrict, or control a physical object. In this case, the physical object that is being controlled is a person's body. Therefore, it makes sense that a person could break out of that kind of psychic control since their body may be stronger than the force acting on it. However, mind control is a completely different concept. This is when one uses their mind to attack or control another person's mind, not their brain as that is a physical object. Believe it or not, but the mind and brain are completely different concepts even though some may use them interchangeably. I kind of got a little off topic there, but the main point is that breaking out of mind control with physical strength just doesn't make sense. Because when your mind gets hijacked, you no longer have the will to use your physical strength. The only way someone could break out of mind control is if they have some kind of mental resistance, which is actually the topic of the next subsection. But before I move on, I want to talk about this one comment that claimed Goku could resist mind control because he was able to overcome the illusion warriors in Dragon Ball Super. I was quite baffled by this comment because there isn't any connection between the illusion warriors and mind control. If I'm remembering this correctly, these warriors appeared because Goku and Krillin were in the forest where their past enemies from their memories took form and attacked them. That is not mind control. If anything, that is mind reading. Goku being able to beat them with a calm mind doesn't mean that he is immune to mind control. That just means that the illusions were dependent on his mental state. If anything, this aids my argument more than theirs, but I'll get back to that later. Goku has done mental training, therefore he can resist mind control. The argument for this one is quite simple. Unlike many Dragon Ball Z characters, Goku has done some mental training. It's not like he just focuses on his physical power. This was a problem for Ginyu when he took Goku's body from him, because Goku's fight style incorporates both his physical and mental training. While this may be a legitimate inference, this isn't one that I would make simply because I don't believe that knowing some mental abilities, like mind reading and telepathy, indicate that you know how to prevent another person from invading your mind. Like I said, it may be a valid assumption for some to believe, but it's a bit too much for me to even consider. But I have a bit more than that to substantiate my argument. Let's bring this back to the illusion warriors. Alright, so if it was really true that Goku's mind couldn't be messed with, then how would a forest be able to even pull memories from it? This suggests that even if Goku does have mental defenses, he isn't using them all the time, otherwise no warriors would have appeared from his memories in the first place. Vegeta resisted Babidi's mind control, therefore Goku can resist any kind of mind control as well. So this is a comment I received frequently on my video. My main contention with this argument is the simple fact that different mind controlling abilities work in different ways. Let me explain what I mean by that. Babidi's mind control only works on those who have evil in their heart. Therefore, Vegeta's resistance may have been due to the fact that he wasn't evil enough for Babidi to control. Sure, Vegeta had negative characteristics which begun to take over in the first place, but I believe his other more neutral emotions, like his Saiyan pride and his desire to fight Goku, greatly helped him resist this. 
And on top of that, I don't think Vegeta was actually that evil at the time. He wanted Bobbity to take over his body, so I believe he upsold his negative emotions in order for Bobbity to notice him. I have a much more extensive argument that I don't really want to get into right now because I could spend an entire video talking about Vegeta's character development and I probably will in the future. But to sum it up, I think that Vegeta escaped Bobbity's mind control because of a very specific set of circumstances that can't be extrapolated to being able to resist all forms of mind control. This mind control has very different and relevant weaknesses than ones like Itoshi Shinsho's, so I wouldn't compare them. If Deku could break out of Shinsho's brainwashing, then Goku can as well. This argument represents a fundamental misunderstanding of what went down at the UA Sports Festival. Basically, what I'm here to tell you is that Goku did not break out of brainwashing with pure strength. There are some who argue that Shinzo's abilities are limited based on physical strength, and I'll get into that a little later, but this event does not prove that at all. So first, let's talk about how Shinzo's brainwashing works. If he speaks to you and you respond, you would be immediately placed under his technique. However, there's a really easy way to get out. If you receive a physical jolt or push, then the brainwashing immediately comes undone. Now let's take a look at what happened to Deku. Since we now have some more context from season five, we know that brainwashing interacts with One For All in a really unique way. Brainwashing pushes Deku into a special subconscious realm that exists within One For All. Somehow that subconscious state connected with his physical body and allowed One For All to essentially misfire. The impact of that shock was able to wake up Deku from that technique. Basically the reason Deku was able to escape was because of circumstances that were completely unique to Deku. Goku doesn't have a subconscious realm like this, so I wouldn't say that just because Deku did it that means Goku could definitely do it as well. Shinsho's abilities have limits. Like I said earlier, there are definitely some people who assume that Shinsho's brainwashing is limited by the physical strength of his opponent. However, there is nothing in the show that could be used to even make that inference. One comment by Thomas Horn implied that I was using the no limits fallacy, which he defines as stating, we have never seen it fail, therefore it can affect God. I assume here that he is talking about the Christian God who is simultaneously all powerful and all knowing. If that is what he is talking about, then I don't think Shinsho's powers would work on God. If he is all powerful, then that means he has every type of power, including the power to resist Shinsho's brainwash. If he is all knowing, then he would know how to avoid even triggering this ability. My main point is that Goku isn't all powerful. He may have God Key, but that is a completely different thing from the all powerful and all knowing God. Shinsho's abilities definitely have limits, but there isn't anything that could even indicate that those limits are based on his opponent's strength. He also made some really weird comparisons that I wanted to talk about. He compared brainwashing to boo turning Vegito into a candy ball. He argued that Goku is stronger than Vegito was then, which I definitely disagree with, but that's not worth arguing. He then claimed that Vegito not having a brain or any internal organs yet still being able to move implies that Goku would be able to resist any kind of mind control abilities. Like I said earlier, the brain and the mind are two different concepts. While Vegito didn't have a brain, he clearly had a mind intact. And I just wouldn't compare these abilities because only one of them is specifically attacking the mind. Boo's ability indirectly attacked the mind. It was magic, a concept that is not new to Dragon Ball and Vegito was somewhat able to overcome that. This doesn't imply that he could overcome actual mind control. The second comparison he made was to Genyu's body change. He said that Genyu couldn't use Goku's body to max capacity, and since Shinsho doesn't even have an understanding of the concept of Ki, then he wouldn't be able to use Goku's body at all. The flaw with this line of thinking is that the way these abilities work is completely different. In order to completely use Goku's body, Genyu needed to have a complex understanding of how he used his mind and body to work together as one. However, Shinto's brainwashing doesn't involve any sort of possession. It's not like Shinto is actually inside Goku's mind and intricately controlling every little thing, which means that all he needs to do is tell Goku to do something, and he will. Of the two, I think the Vegito argument was a bit more interesting, but when you really get into them, neither of these made much sense. In Dragon Ball, hacks don't work against a person who is stronger than the one initiating the hacks. This one is just flat out not true, but before I get into that, I have to explain what hacks are, I guess. I haven't really heard this term that much before, but from my understanding, hacks are abilities that require more than punching and kicking to overcome. Like Hit's time skip, for instance. Knowing this, the initial statement doesn't make much sense to me as there are multiple occasions where hacks abilities worked against stronger people. Like Ginyu's body change worked against Goku, even though Goku was stronger. Actually, body change is a technique that was made with the specific purpose of stealing the body of a stronger opponent. Gildo's time freeze always worked against his stronger opponents. Vegito was turned to can despite being stronger than Boo. Even though Vegito did resist this to some extent, he couldn't resist the actual transformation itself. 
time skip has been shown to work on people who were stronger than hit. Not to mention, I haven't seen anyone do any real damage to Botamo. There are some examples from GT as well, but we don't have to talk about that. The point is that there are so many instances where this isn't the case, so making a claim like that is very strange. Now, it could be argued that once you are a certain magnitude of strength higher than your opponent, their hacks won't work. Like Hit's time manipulation worked against a lot of stronger people, but it didn't work against Jiren. Perhaps that's because Jiren is at a whole other level of strength that he surpassed the gap that the hacks closed. There are plenty of examples of resisting telekinesis, but I've already explained and gone through all of that. But even if this is the case, that doesn't mean that this is true of other universes like My Hero Academia. Dragon Ball operates under a different power system, so you can't apply all of the same rules to My Hero Academia. Goku is very durable, so quirks like the K and Overhaul won't work on him. Alright, so this is the last argument I'll be going over in this video, and it has two additional sub-arguments. The idea behind this one is quite simple. Shigaraki and Overhaul have never used their abilities against someone who is as strong as Goku. Therefore, we don't even know if it will work. That is a statement that I obviously can't disagree with. However, I do believe that it is more likely that these abilities will work than not, because from what I have seen, durability doesn't seem to be a limiting factor of these quirks. And even if durability was a limiting factor, there's no evidence that Goku has surpassed that durability limit. Now, I'm not saying that these quirks have no limits as that would be using the no limit fallacy. I'm just saying that there isn't anything to even indicate that these limits would be based on the affected item's durability. There are clear limits that we can define though. Let's focus on Shigaraki for right now. We know that he needs to use all five of his fingers for his quirk to act in any effective manner. The limit is a little more ambiguous now since the quirk did evolve, but let's just say that is the limit for the purposes of this video. Since he can't fully grasp fluids, decay won't work against them. It seems like it only works against solids. That means I can reasonably deduce that this ability won't work against key blasts and key barriers, as they are states of matter that are very unique in nature. These are limits that have been clearly defined by the series. However, there are definitely other limits that haven't been explicitly defined but could be inferred. Like it seems to take a conscious effort from Sugar Rocky in order for the spread of decay to continue. In season one during the USJ arc, we see Sugar Rocky touch Eraser Head and the decay starts for him, but then he uses his Eraser Quirk to stop himself from decaying. This action reveals quite a bit about the nature of decay because Eraser shouldn't have been able to stop the effects of a quirk once they have been activated. It should only be able to stop the act Activation. Let me try to explain this with an analogy. Let's say Endeavor uses his Hellflame quirk to start a forest fire. Once the fire has been set and continues to grow, the Razorhead can't use his quirk to put out the forest fire because that is spreading on its own with no conscious effort from Endeavor. He can only use his quirk to stop Endeavor from making more fire. Let's now bring this back to Shigaraki. The fact that Aizawa's quirk worked in stopping the spread of decay after it had been activated implies that there is a conscious effort involved to maintain the spread. This isn't the only indication of this though as we have seen various decay rates from Shigaraki's victims. This may imply that he can consciously control the speed of it, so we can infer from all of that that Shigaraki needs a conscious effort to maintain decay. It also may be reasonable to assume that if he is not unconscious that decay would stop. Again, none of this is confirmed, but I believe that this is a decent inference that may allow us to assess the limits of Shigaraki's abilities. I can make inferences to say that decay may have a surface area and volume limit, but the truth is that there is nothing in the show that allows me to even infer that there may be a durability ability limit. If there was, then I think at the very least we would see Shigaraki struggling even a little bit to destroy more durable objects, but we don't. Again, I'm not saying with 100% certainty that there isn't a durability limit, but like I said at the beginning, I think that more likely than not, this will work on Goku. Another thing I wanted to mention is that even though Goku is durable, he does let his guard down quite a bit. I remember in Dragon Ball Super, there was an instance where he allowed himself to get injured by a bullet. Most of the scenarios in that 38% chance that I gave Shigaraki to win are scenarios in which Goku is very relaxed or has his guard down. So even if I do acknowledge that Goku is too strong for this ability, that wouldn't change Shigaraki's chances of winning since Goku definitely would be more vulnerable with his guard down. You may have noticed that I gave Shigaraki a 38% chance, while in the original video I actually said that he had a 45% chance. I dropped it because I thought it was a bit too high before. My reasoning for making it that high is just that I thought he had a better chance than Overhaul who I gave a 35% chance at victory. However, a 10 point increase was a little insane. 3 points make so much more sense. With that correction out of the way, let's get back to the video. He blasts disintegrate people, and Goku has survived plenty of key blasts. Therefore, quirks like Decay and Overhaul won't work against him. 
So this was a really interesting yet also a really weird argument. It was much more difficult to argue with the comments on this one because it was difficult to explain why this logic doesn't really hold up. Basically, key blasts are not disintegration itself in the same way Shigaraki's decay is, and overhaul isn't disintegration, so even by that logic it wouldn't apply to this quirk. Key blasts disintegrating people is not a very consistent thing in Dragon Ball as we have seen them do so many different things, like cut, push, pierce, and straight up just injure people. Even time where key blasts were meant to disintegrate, like when Goku tried to kill Frieza on planet Namek, Frieza was still able to survive. He was much weaker than Goku at the time as he barely had any strength. Goku definitely went for the kill in that instance, but Frieza didn't die. This just goes to show that Ki Blast disintegrating people isn't always consistent. One person argued that only showing one example of inconsistency doesn't prove that it is inconsistent, which is just not true, but off the top of my head I can definitely think of another example. In Dragon Ball Super during the Universal Survival Saga, Goku was hit with his own spirit bomb and presumed to be dead. However, he ended up coming out of that situation alive with a new transformation and not disintegrated. Now there are multiple explanations as to why he didn't die despite being overpowered, like the spirit bomb only destroys evil and Goku was able to absorb its energy before it killed him. Either way, it not disintegrating him completely negates the idea that Key Blast carried the essence of disintegration like Shigaraki's Decay does. That might have been confusing, and I'm sorry if it was. I have another explanation that is hopefully a bit more clear, as it involves another analogy. So let's say there is this really strong man. This man doesn't feel any pain when I punch him, even if I punch him as hard as I can. Does that make this man immune to pain? Well, to a certain extent, yeah, it does. If your punches aren't strong enough, then he won't feel any pain. Therefore, he is kind of immune to pain to a certain extent. Now, let's say I come back to this man, but this time I have the power to activate his nose receptors or pain receptors. No matter how weak I am, I would be able to make this guy feel pain because my power is pain itself. It doesn't matter how durable he is because my ability would have bypassed that durability to activate those receptors. The same applies to the Shikaraki situation. Key blasts are not disintegration itself. Like punches aren't pain itself. While Goku is definitely strong and durable enough to survive a powerful key blast attack, I believe that that fence would be bypassed by an ability that is disintegration itself. Goku has survived Takai, therefore he can survive both decay and overhaul. This one is tricky. I saw a couple of comments use his arguments, but it was difficult to explain why that doesn't make much sense. So hopefully I can explain it better in a video format. Basically, the essence of the techniques, decay, Overhaul and Hakai are too different for me to compare in this manner. Let's once again move Overhaul to the side for a bit and focus on Hakai and Decay. While they appear to be similar, they actually couldn't be more different. Decay will make a person disintegrate while Hakai erases a person's existence. With Decay, there is proof of the victim's existence as they leave behind their dust. In this way, it follows the law of conservation of mass, which is that mass cannot be created nor destroyed. Hakai clearly does not follow that law as it is able to erase mass from the existence of the universe. It is complete destruction, which makes it very different from a technique like Decay. It doesn't just do what Decay does, but more. It is fundamentally different. Compared to Decay, Hakai is pretty much magic, while Decay is much more physical. I also don't know if Goku resisted Hakai itself. It seemed as if he resisted the activation of the technique. He wasn't being destroyed in the same way we've seen Hakai used in the past, which leads me to believe that he was resisting the attack activating rather than the destruction effect. It was like he was pushing back on it before he dissolved into nothingness. If he let up his guard, he would have been obliterated. So how did Goku resist Hakai? Well, the answer is pretty simple. He used his key. It was a weaker and different form of Hakai, so it was possible for Goku to actually be able to resist the attack with his key. Had he used up all of his energy, he definitely would have been erased right there. He's lucky that Beerus arrived before it was too late. But basically, this was able to happen because it was all key, and this is a key power system. The K isn't a key based technique like Hakai is, so there's no telling if Goku would be able to even resist the activation in the same way. Now, if you want to make the comparison between these techniques, go ahead. I can't stop you. However, I can't reasonably conclude that Goku can resist Overhaul and Decay like he resisted Hakai because they are fundamentally too different. And like I said earlier, even if I assumed that Goku could resist these quirks at full power, most of the scenarios in which Shigaraki and Overhaul win are ones in which Goku isn't fighting efficiently, which would definitely make him more vulnerable to these type of attacks. Don't get it twisted, I don't think that it is more likely that Shigaraki nor Overhaul would beat Goku than the other way around. I just think that given the conditions of the fight, it is definitely possible, especially because Goku isn't a perfect warrior. He is a fighting genius, but he consistently makes mistakes and tends to relax when he thinks he has the upper hand. One person claimed that Goku letting his guard down was something that he never did back in Z and it was just a super thing. That is definitely not true. Goku underestimated Ginyu, which is why he got his body snatched. He clearly let his guard down around Vegeta during their fight in the Buu Saga. He 
also let his guard down around Nappa, which forced him to use his Kaioken. There are plenty of other examples of Goku just underestimating his opponents or flat out just letting his guard down in Z alone. I used to also believe that Goku was a perfect warrior and the only way a person could stop him was if they were stronger than him. But after watching Super, my perspective on the series changed. I started to notice more stuff about Goku's personality and fight style, which made me realize that he could be a bit cocky. He's not cocky like Vegeta, but he does stuff like letting his guard down around people he perceives to be weak, which can put him in some dangerous situations. But even with all of that in mind, I don't think that the My Hero Verse would come out victorious in an all-out battle against Goku. And I believe that Goku is so strong that he is more likely than not to win most of his one-on-one -on -one fights as well. Some may claim that I am biased for My Hero Academia here, but if anything, it's the other way around. Think about it, I am so biased for Goku that I believe that even though he has all of these flaws as a fighter, he is still more likely to come out on top. I'm running defense here trying to explain the small percentage chances of how Goku might potentially lose in these battles. But given the topic of the video, it was bound to be a bit controversial, so I understand the negative comments. Moving forward, I probably won't be responding to arguments like, Goku is multiversal, My Hero Academia characters don't stand a chance, because I feel like I've already addressed that and it is just boring. I probably also won't be responding to the comments that use the exact same arguments that I addressed in this video. I am definitely open to expanding on them through new arguments. I had a lot of fun making the last video and responding to those comments, but some of the arguments got a bit monotonous. That's why I decided to make this video. I wanted to address all of them so I don't feel like I have to explain my argument over and over again. I hope that everything is clear now and maybe we can have some better discourse. If you liked my video, maybe you should check out another one. I cover a variety of different topics on this channel, mostly my hair academia right now, so I hope to see you there. This has been the Hot Rodster. I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.